Okay, so welcome. We are a small but mighty group, and that's okay. I know Thursday and some of you got tomorrow off for a PD day, so it's a big long week and a rushed month, so welcome aboard. We are going to be unpacking grade four matter today, and we will be sharing sort of all of the different components of that curriculum. We're going to look at big concepts and how those link to the skills and how we can unpack those as far as an assessment perspective. So welcome, my name is Chris Arsky. I'm one of the consultants with the CART Consortia, and I work with an absolutely fantastic partner. You, you have to experience it to know what I'm saying, um, Ted Zeroni, who is just phenomenal to work with in science. So I'm gonna let Ted introduce himself as well. Thanks, Chris. Um, that's quite a nice introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm, my name is Ted Zerody. I'm uh, um, an educational consultant with the Edmonton Regional Learning Consortia and coming in from you from that, from this area. So welcome aboard, everyone. Okay, so you will be getting copies of the slide deck and resources that we shared with you. They'll be all in the folder. And if you're not sure where the folder is at the end of the session, we will put that in and get you into the right place to make sure that you know where to look for it. So as we did in our last sessions as well in the pilot series, whenever we have the acknowledgement page, we try to link some information in there, not just the acknowledgement, but maybe why we do the acknowledgement and what, what part of that acknowledgement has some significance um, to the organizing idea that we're talking about. So uh, what we're looking at here with Matter is we provided you with a, um, a Venn diagram which basically looks at how does Indigenous, what does the Indigenous lens of science say, and what does the Western science say, and how do those compare? So this will be for information. I'm not going to go through it all. I'm not going to add pieces into it. But if you're going across, you can kind of see that when I look on the Indigenous side, I see that the holistic is the first bullet that's there. Whereas when we go over to Western view of science, what I'm looking at is that part to whole. So it's how do we see, how do they see the science? How do we see the science? Where do we find those common grounds? And there's a lot of common ground that we see in between the two worlds as well. So it's worth going through and, and it's important for us to know that as teachers because students that are in our class should be able to see themselves in every lesson that we have. So how do I bring that to life? What, what is it that I need to be infusing into my, into my curriculum as I go through it? So in a spirit of reconciliation, we want to acknowledge that this is gathering is taking place on traditional lands across the province of Alberta, home to many diverse First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. We acknowledge that this land is a traditional meeting ground giving voice to its original peoples and the story of creation of this country in a way that history has forgotten. And information about that Venn diagram is found at the bottom. There are links there if you want to get the original article that it comes from the paper and have a look through it. So as we go through any of these sessions that we do with you in grades four, five, and six, or K to three for that matter, we'll have a very similar look to them every time. We'll always kind of give you a bit of a backgrounder. In other words, if you were teaching science next year, grade four, and maybe some of you are because there's many schools that are uh, carrying on with it, um, the students won't necessarily land at your doorstep with the prerequisite knowledge. This is no longer sort of a science in a box, as we called it when we did the uh, pilot. You're not teaching your five sort of topics and then they move on to five new topics and then they move on to five new topics. This is very much a spiraled curriculum where the outcomes and some key concepts that lived in kindergarten get carried into grade one, which then become the foundational building block for grade two and grade three and then grade three for grade four. And some of those really big concepts that live right from kindergarten on go all the way through to grade six. So it's really important that you know kind of what, what would they have in a perfect world had they gone through K123 in the science program, what would they be arriving at my doorstep? So in the slide decks, we're going to backfill some information that you would see what they've done, but also moreover for you to get a sense of, oh, I might need to go back to that with, with my kids. I'm pretty sure they won't know that. Or use some of it as sort of a pre-assessment to see what the knowledge level of your students are. Then as I said, we'll unpack sort of that surface deep and transfer levels. Um, how do we get to those pieces of the concepts? How do they um, link to the skills and procedures? How do I unpack that? 
Um, and Ted will take, take you through that in a phenomenal way. And then we have some books and resources and some links that you might be able to use that will help you with your planning as well. So if we look at kind of what they have done previous to this, not so much, there's lots of work that's been done in kindergarten and grade one when we talk about objects and properties, but really this unit that we're getting into is really, it's got the two um, cusps in it and they're really focused on that recycling. Now that means I still need to understand materials, I need to understand a little bit about that, but this is not gonna be completely new to them in a, in a really perfect world. Again, if they've gone through K to three and arrived at your doorstep, they will have already done some of that work around the world of recycle. And so this is just some slides that we've taken from grade two to show you what that kind of looks like. So one of their questions is, how does human behavior affect plants and animals? Very much uh, what we're talking about when we say, why do we recycle, right? What, what is the, what kind of damage do we do and what were our benefits of, of human interaction with, with the world? And so again, we just ask them about the picture, ask them to see if, you know, there's things that they can connect to that, what they're feeling about it. We suggest some reading of some books that they might want to do to get their heads into thinking about what they see and we are the keepers of the earth and, and how do we how do we keep the earth and how well do I do that and and then bringing in again those those concepts of recycling. So we introduce that symbol to them we talk about the three R's and the four R's in this case because we do also talk about um, the reusing of an ice of an item. And then we've got some things in here, uh, the videos that the teachers could show the students and then have a dialogue with them after the fact or use that as the teaching piece and you glean out uh, what did they learn and then we start to build our unit from there. So how am I impacting one earth? What's my role? And then again, how do I take care of the environment? So these are very relevant. Um, and because you are just starting from scratch, literally with the students, um, that doesn't mean you couldn't go grab some of these videos. They'd be very appropriate for that and it would simply give you a little bit of background with the students as well. There are four R's, we talk about them. They are asked to and tasked with looking around their environment to see how well they are stewards of the land and, and are they are they in fact in their school areas doing that? Are they doing it outside in the playground? So we ask them to understand what reducing, recycling, reusing and repurposing mean. And then again, they have some, some videos here that, that link to that as well. We have a, a suggested book that they can read. What's the adventures of the life of, a, of an aluminum can? And, and that's a really good one because it talks about the can getting lost and dropped on the ground and what would happen if it stayed there and, and all these pieces. So again, it's a, a way that we can introduce literature into the classroom at the same time. But now I'm reading you a story as a, as a gleaning of information to see what they come out of it and what, what's their feedback. We move a little bit forward into uh, the material discussions. We talk about how materials have states of change matter. We look at those three states of matter and that comes directly from grade three, but that's important for them to understand too, because if we're talking about waste and being thrown onto the ground, like what is going to actually be degradable and, and what isn't and how long would that take and what is the substance that it's made of? So these are important pieces for them to have a good understanding of from previous grades. And certainly the states of matter would be important for them to understand. Um, what are the different kinds of material uses and man-made versus, um, natural products and that makes a huge difference when we're going to have that conversation about how can I how can I be a good steward well if I use more natural products I need to know what that means so I've included some of the slides on discussions about materials this is a fantastic little video about introducing them to different kinds of materials and what are the properties of those materials um, uh, and then they they even suggest right in there and it's a good one to watch as a quick review even um, just pause it. Can they start naming some other materials that relate to the one that was being demonstrated there uh, and have that conversation about the property? So the properties, and these are just some of the lay language, not necessarily our scientific terms that we use. They get much more in depth with that. But, you know, talking about whether something's breakable, flexible, when they do it in grade one and two, they talk about, can I twist it? Can I stretch it? Well, now we've gone beyond that. Is it bounce? Is it brittle? Um, you know, all of those terminologies that we want to make sure that the students are familiar with. So this is coming out of grade three. 
And then I've included just a link. The link is at the top here of these lessons. So if it's deemed by you that, you know, we could benefit from doing a little bit of work there, then you might want to use some of these. I'm not saying all of them. I'm just providing you with a slide that gives you all. You can have a look at them. Um, and then the same thing with materials. Like who really cares about whether, why do I want to test a material? Why do I care about it? Well, now in grade four, we're going to say, hey, you know, how are you going to keep the earth healthy? Well, knowing something about the materials that an object is made from is going to be absolutely critical and relevant. And so we introduce to them even, you know, the material scientist and what their role is and, and what their job is. So talking about man-made, um, talking about processed, we give them some links here if you want to have a look at those. Um, again, looking at a natural environment versus a city, pointing out the things in the city that are man-made, but also in the city. Ozark is looking for some assistance. Please be nice. We also have situations where in a city, we have lots of man-made structures, but lots of natural structures of parks. So we want them to be able to see them both. We don't want them to think that it's just one or the other. And then I've included the states of matter because those are critical for them to understand. And so that would be a great video for them to go through as well. We've got some on food, a book in here, it's called Nature of Matter. So that's one resource that we're suggesting might be a good one. Um, again, these are some books that come directly from the Pearson Library or some that are from the US, from a, a teacher created materials from their science. Uh, we're just reviewing some of these right now to see what fits. This is one that fits really nicely. So I've given you both the, um, the authors on here and you'll have that information at the back and sources and what's in each of these little books. I'm not suggesting buy a whole class set of them. It's just if you're looking for something for your in-class library, this comes out of another resource. Is it solid? Is it liquid? And it's talked, that's exactly the name of the book. Is it solid and liquid? There's another series that comes from um, uh, the graphic library. So every one of the pages has basically a cartoon kind of image to it, the graphic organizer kind of image. And it comes with um, sort of that superhero and he goes through and he unpacks. Very popular with the kids and very appropriate for their age level. So this one talks about states of matter. Okay. So let's jump in to grade four. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ted. Thanks, Chris. Uh, this uh, organizing idea uh, is actually a fairly short one. And uh, as you see, as we go through it, there's, there's a couple understandings associated with this organizing idea, but they're, they're pretty factual and pretty cut and dried. So. We still uh, take a look at the organizing idea through these three phases of learning. Those of you who've seen our, our opening video are familiar with this, or those of you who are with us, the pilot will also be familiar with this. I'm not going to go through this in, in, in a lot of um, depth. All I want to do is say that um, when Chris and I now are going to start looking at the grade four curriculum, we're going to take a look at each cusp line and say, well, what is the surface part that we can teach and address at the surface level in this cusp line? And how do we take that move to the deep or the uh, understanding part? And then what are some things we can do to deepen that with certain learning activities to get to a point where kids, we can see that they're transferring it to new contexts and even using uh, that transfer um, opportunity for an assessment because we're looking for new contexts with, within there. So we're looking at the surface uh, level of learning. It's that basic skills and that basic um, individual concepts, really understanding what they are and uh, we'll just start taking a look at that now. So that's how we're gonna pack this curriculum. Just a, a quick review again, if we go to the next slide. Um, when we're talking about skills, we're talking about a specific skill, not the entire um, uh, statement in the skills and procedures line. For example, if the, um, if the um, skills and procedures said, compare and contrast um, the different methods of waste management, the skill part would be the compare and contrast, not that they're comparing, not the whole thing of using the um, the different um, management techniques. A procedure is, uh, is simply a list of steps or sequence that students go through uh, in order to get something done. So uh, with 
we'll take a, we'll talk about a little bit about the, the scientific methods later on. Um, and there are certain procedures or steps to take in order to do the scientific investigation. So uh, that's one of the things that would be looked at the, at the surface level to make sure students understand that. And the other thing, again, are the individual concepts. Uh, and we'll highlight those for you as we go along here. We can go to the next slide, Chris. And the concepts, uh, again, are those organizing ideas. They're those uh, words that that category that that are the sort of the um, the organizers and, and the key ideas that we're working with. So fruit, for example, is a concept. Um, and for those reasons, it's got attributes and it's got examples. And we can see uh, fruits across a bunch of different spectrums. So it's those concepts as well that we're going to pull out and, and work with at the surface level before we get to the understanding piece. Another graphic to help explain that, oh, we're going to go on to look at what are the key concepts in this organizing right. idea. No, that's perfect. Um, yeah, I just want to point out to how to read this concept map. You'll get a copy of this one. You'll have all the other ones as well with all the other organizing ideas. And I don't know if you can read this on your screen or not. It might be kind of small, but I just want to begin at the very top with waste and sort of read through a couple of the lines just to give you a sense of how you can read through this to get a good sense of what is uh, in this organizing idea and, and what's uh, involved in, in working with it. So being at, at the beginning at the top, uh, waste includes dangerous materials, which can be uh, natural or process materials, uh, and they are identified by symbols. Uh, now I should have a line that waste can also be natural and process materials of any kind as well. Uh, waste, if we go off to the left, um, exists in different um, states of matter. And those, again, as Chris mentioned, were taken in, in the grade three organizing idea. Uh, and as well, natural materials and process materials, those were, were looked at uh, closely in grade two and three. So students would be familiar with this, um, those two concepts by now if they had been, uh, if they've taken the grade two and the grade three course with the new curriculum. Um, just going to the right, right, uh, waste requires management methods such as landfill or burning, um, but those have an environmental impact. Um, in fact, all management methods have an environmental impact that can be negative, but there are some impact reduction methods such as reducing, repairing, composting, and all the others that you see there. And so this is uh, these are the big ideas in this organizing idea. I believe it's quite similar to the old science unit where I think waste management was a key part of that. So this is going to be very similar to, to those of you currently teaching uh, grade four science. Uh, those are the main concepts. I'd like to share with you this other um, graphic. This is a progression of the, the concepts from kindergarten to grade six in the matter organizing idea. And again, just to show you how those some of those big concepts can really flow through the grades, uh, properties is, is something that is important introduced in kindergarten because we're looking at observable properties of objects. And then in grade one, we're looking at the measurable properties of objects, so we're, uh, such as set, uh, area, length, and weight, and so on. I should mention at kindergarten, the observable observable properties are those that we can observe with the senses. By the time we get to grade three, we're talking about testable properties, uh, or grade two and three, because we testable properties and how properties can change in grade three. And that's where we get the, the, the change in matter. Uh, and finally, when we get to grade four, that, that change in matter, and it change, not change in matter, but change of states. The change of states moves up because we do talk about it in terms of types of waste as we go along a little bit here. And you can see how that whole sense of material and, and states of matter is brought into grade four in the underlining way. And of course, properties itself extends into grade five as well. So there is this is that spiral cur curriculum at work, uh, uh, putting layer of learning on learning on some of the concepts to deepen their understanding of them. We can go to the next slide, Chris. Um, so when we're, when we're trying to then unpack a, a cusp line and teach that cusp line, what we really have to focus on is the understanding. That is really the, the big, big thing to, to get at here. And the understanding here with the first cusp line is that responsible methods of waste management can reduce the negative environmental impacts. And so um, when we take a look at that, we see responsible methods, uh, waste man or me methods of waste management and negative environmental impacts. 
And if we take a look then to the left, we can see methods of waste management and some of the, and we can explore what some of those negative impacts are with landfills and burning. Uh, and then there are methods of waste management that can reduce those environmental impacts. Uh, or look at other concepts like production con and uh, consumption, and of course, waste materials in general. So when you look at the, that, uh, that cusp like that, we look through that, that lens. And so to begin working at the surface level, I just go to the next graphic, Chris, if you don't mind. So we pull those out, and it's those concepts there that we work with at the surface level to help students understand those uh, those big things. But at the surface level, if you take a look, sorry, just looking at the skills and processes, you can see that eventually we're going to get kids to compare. We're going to get them to discuss things and represent things and, and develop a personal plan. So what I'm going to do is pull out compare, discuss, and represent, say, We've got to make sure that if we're going to use those skills for kids to demonstrate their understanding or their knowledge, we want it to, at the surface level, make sure they're familiar with those specific skills. And that graphic is evident on the next slide. So at the surface level, we not only pull out the individual concepts to make sure students know what they are, and they're, they're probably familiar with most of those. Um, and by this time, they're probably likely familiar with uh, compare, discuss, and represent, but you'll want to do some pre-assessment, pre-observing to see where students are with those as well. And if they need some, some work with those, then that's what we do at the surface level before we go on to putting the whole thing all together and work with uh, looking at waste management and the overall impacts that it has. So we'll begin with looking at some surface level activities that might help along the way or to get you going. So again, this is one of those units where you're going to have to decide kind of up front, do you want them to explore sort of through an inquiry lens where I don't necessarily tell you that here are the ways that we can we can handle waste management. Um, in fact, some of those kids might not even know what waste management is, right? That's a good starting point. But in this case, we could just even say to them, our earth needs help. Does it need help? And I've got a picture here of, a, of an earth that has sort of exploding with garbage just to get their, he their heads around it. So you can either start very open and find out what they know about it, or we can start off with some of the terminology and, and see where it's at. But just some statements that have been made on the other sides, on both sides of them, we can get student feedback on that to get a sense of whether or not they even have an understanding of what this is. I might just wanna start with pictures. Maybe I don't even show them that first one. Maybe all I do is show them, what do you see? Right, and, and they might say, oh, I see, I see garbage, I see, plastic bottles. Okay, what do I see here? Oh, I see tons of garbage there. I see stuff floating in the water. So they're getting a sense of where we're going to go here. And I don't even have to say to them, this is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about recycling. I might just start with three pictures. And that's kind of my style is I just go in and say, hey, what do you see on the pictures? What are you seeing? What do you think we're going to be talking about? Right? And, and just feeding them through through that lens. So our earth needs help, obviously. It doesn't look too good the way it is right now. So open-ended question, what do you think we can do about this? And they might say the word recycle. Then we might ask them, what do you think that means, right? Let's get a sense of what they understand about it rather than me just delivering that information to them. What can you do about it? Is there somebody that already does something? Do you already do that at your house? Do you sort out things? Just get a sense of what they know and what they don't know. This is a great little video, it comes from the national news. They did a, a story on Canada's waste problem. Right. And again, I could just show them that I could start with those pictures, show them this and say, now, what do you think we're going to be talking about? Right. They've got a lot of information in their back pocket now that they can have a good sense of where it's going to go. Might ask them, have you seen this? That comes right from grade two. This is the same slide. So do you know what that means? And some they'll say, well, that means recycle. OK, so what does that mean? And what does the words waste management mean? Get a sense of what they think it means. Write some words down on the board. Just, just to see, again, where they're at and where you might be able to, to start going from. So again, you had all of these different um, types of waste management that were available, that were listed there. And remember that when the word include shows up in your curriculum document, that means that whatever's behind it, we need to make sure that's part of our lesson. Now, I could stand up and deliver and tell you all of those and what they mean, or I could maybe use a case study. Right. And that's that might be the way I would go is 
which management strategy has the least environmental impact and most benefit to the environment? Because every one of them has, a, there's a benefit and there's there's something else that's happening in the background. Could be a, could be a negative to it as well. But which one is? And that's a good question to ask. And they might say, well, I don't know. But this is my case study. We're going to start unpacking them either in teams and they're going to come back and report. You're going to do them as centers. They're going to move around. And then they're going to start to draw some conclusions and come back to have an answer to that question. Or we unpack it as a class one at a time. So whatever works best for you, these are just ideas. But we might talk to them about here's here's an example of, of a definition for waste management and what it means. So now we're being tasked to figure out how do we how do we get rid of our garbage and dispose of it in a in a proper way so that our environment is good. And what are some of the ways that that we do that now? And is that good or is it bad? Is there a better way that we should think about? So again, these are just ways for them to unpack it. And with each one, there's information. So in this case, we're highlighting recycle. So these videos relate to whichever one is being highlighted here. When I look at the next one, oh, sorry, these have links in them. I could look at, oh, sorry, I think I skipped one there. No, I didn't. When I look at the five R's, because that's what that one was referring to, I've, I've just given you a bit of a link here about 50 interesting informations about recycling. Everybody thinks that recycling is great. But there's some downfalls to it as well, right? And and that we're, that's very much in the news today. Those are very much things that are being talked about. So do the kids even think that every time they do something for recycling, is it good? It is good in practice, but we there's some some things that are happening in the world now that is saying the practice is great. The problem is nobody thought about what happens with the practice. What are we going to do with all this stuff? So that's in some of those links that we're talking about. So do each of these um, improve our environment? And if so, how does it improve our environment? Could look at composting. Okay, composting has lots of benefits, very few negatives, but there, you know, it depends on where you live. If you live in the mountains, like I did for 15 years, that's an issue because you 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 have your little composting bin, but you also have the bear that comes in helps himself on a regular basis. So, you know, you're, you're kind of counterproductive and it doesn't really give you much security. PBS had a great uh, video on that. If you've never subscribed to PBS, it's free for teachers. They have excellent, excellent videos that you can show in every topic. So I encourage you to have a look at, at those for sure. Um, what about combusting? Why don't we just burn it all, right? Just burn the garbage and let's, what's the problem there? Well, there's some problems obviously with the smoke that comes, that, that, that arises and the particles that are left out. So again, each one of these has its own little bit of information, which if you're gonna do it as a group, if you're gonna do it as um, a center, then they can go around and watch the videos with headphones or however you do it, or we unpack it as a class or we unpack it as a team. And then the one that I did put a little bit more information on because it is so much in the media with us right now is what do we do with our plastic? Right, we're, we're always saying recycle your plastic bottles, recycle. Now we're really much into, or very, very deep into using a reusable container and having students fill them up in the schools at the filling stations rather than bringing a bottled water to school. So what happens to plastic? And what's the problems with it right now? And then what's a before and after possibility? So if you're going to use that as sort of as an introductory or an intro piece with students, I would kind of do them in that order because it would make a little bit more sense to get some feedback from them first when they just watch a, a plastic bottle, what's its life cycle look like, and then what happens to it when it goes to the ocean, and, and who's affected by it, and how does it, buy, it, how does it degrade itself? Okay, so just... Again, resources for you, not saying that all the resources in, in January 1990 that are here are the ones that you would use. Sorry, whenever we put links in, it's going to start when I advance. Again, plastics in the environment is another one. And then how can mealworms help us with plastic now, right? They've determined that there's, there's a more healthy way that we might be able to bring these down. So again, just other pieces. Are there other things that they can think of that are man-made that need to be managed? Are there other pieces that come along alongside? One of the videos that I've shared with you talks about 
everybody's so good about recycling and, and recy uh, putting their cardboards into the cardboard container box. But so many of the cardboards now, in lieu of making them out of metal, are lined with aluminum foil inside so that I can put food in it and I don't have to make a styrofoam box for you to take your food home in. Well, that's a whole different ball game because now I can't put that con con that little paper container into the cardboard because it has this lining. So who's taking the lining out? Whose job is that? Because I can't recycle it as cardboard anymore. And so those are important things for the kids to realize as they're going through. Okay, Ted. Got it. If you recall to the um, my previous slide when I began on the far right with the skills procedures, we pulled the idea of compare and contrast into the surface level. And so, um, again, one of those things before we, as you get rolling with this uh, cusp line is to see whether or not kids are adept at comparing and contrasting. If they are where you go, they would have had a lot of experience with it from kindergarten to grade three, because that's one of those skills that shows up uh, in every grade level. We always want to make sure um, at the uh, elementary grade level or primary grades really focus on similarities and differences and comparing with uh, um, and finding similarities and differences with uh, Venn diagrams and things like that. And Chris has lots of activities you can go back to see how that works in her, in the previous videos. Um, but we get to grade uh, starting into grade four and so on. We may want to get a little more. Um, I guess, uh, written oriented and, and uh, gather information and charts for comparing and contrasting. And there's a link there that will show you how to do that. Now, when you click on that link, it sort of, it, it lists, uh, maybe just a quick link. I won't go through the whole thing. Um, but sometimes uh, at surface level, sometimes that direct teaching can, can be helpful. Uh, we say to students, we are going to learn how to compare and contrast today. What is it? It's finding similarities and finding, finding differences. And this, this, um, excuse me, this um, document is here for teacher use. It's not meant to give for the kids. It's what do I do as a teacher to, to plan for a teaching of a skills lesson? And the, the, the lesson steps are there in terms of how you plan for teaching a skill. If you wish to do that, where you define it, um, you identify the steps. Sometimes that just does a lot of metacognition on our, part, on our part. So when I compare and contrast, what do I do? And you make the list of steps. And then, so that's point number three. And when you look at point uh, step four, you'll see that within the steps, there are some concepts uh, and identify a criteria is one of those. Criteria is really important um, because when you do a lot of decision-making, you're gonna use criteria. In fact, criteria is, is I think it's identified already in, in the, um, 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 what, the, the competencies, I think even at grade, in the primary grades, uh, division one, for decision making that students make decisions based on criteria. So we compare and contrast using criteria. We use criteria to evaluate. We use criteria in a lot of contexts. So uh, them to know what that means is important. Uh, really, when they compare and contrast, they're going to do an analysis to find similarities and differences. So what is an analysis? How, what is data? How do you gather that? What's a conclusion? Because at the end of the day, you're going to gather some information in the comparison contrast, and you're going to use that data to make some kind of a conclusion. So I'll highlight those and what you'll have in your resource packet. We're not going to go through those right now. Um, but when you go uh, access this at the when, it, when they be at, posted on the ARPDC site, you'll have some introductory activities or what is the criteria and how you may want to introduce that to your students. So once you know the steps to comparing and contrasting, then you then you demonstrate to the class. Uh, and one of the things we can use, if you could click on the link there, just takes you down to the bottom of the page, Chris. Um, yeah, so you know, generally, this grade can students can start using a chart like this to compare and contrast, where they have the items listed there, and on the side is the criteria for which they're going to use. We can talk about criteria because if you change the criteria around into something that's not so significant, you can have a totally different uh, um, conclusion at the end of the day. Anyway, if you were going to compare two toy boats or something, that's what the the observation sheet might look like. So you get kids to set up their criteria, set up their chart, uh, and then uh, you take each item and compare it to the criteria. So if you take size and move from the left to the right, we're gonna come to a decision based on the information we gathered, whether they're similar or different on based on that one criteria. And the bottom there, there's a little bit of a scale you can use that they're, they're different. Sometimes they're kind of different or somewhat different, somewhat similar. Those just there to help students out. And after all that data is gained, what can you conclude from that? And that's, uh, that's um, 
that's probably the most important part is that kids gather their information, look at it through a lens. In this case, uh, same difference, and they come to some kind of a conclusion about those two votes based on that data that they have. So that's one way to introduce compare and contrasting if you haven't done that with your students yet. Uh, and then on the next slide, I think I just have a, um, a table that might go along with the suggested skills and procedure statement uh, that uh, students compare and contrast the different methods of, um, of, uh, of waste management. Um, so again, you'll, you're going to find out where the kids are good at comparing and contrasting at that surface level. And that's where you, and if they need some help with that, you're going to work with it before you give them that, that particular assignment. You want them to know how to do it fairly independently before you give them this, or at least have had some practice with it. Um, we do know that uh, discussion was also one of the verbs that showed up. Uh, once again, uh, there are multiple ways to do a discussion with your students. For example, if they were to discuss their conclusions with the, the compare and contrast activity we just saw, a discussion is a really good way for them to share their thoughts and ideas. And there's multiple ways uh, other than just sitting in, you know, um, in a general hand up discussion. I'm sure you're all familiar with the uh, gallery walk. Um, even a panel discussion or something like that could work with this particular uh, activity that we just did with the compare and contrast. There is a, a link there as well, the sample discussion checklist. Um, you don't have to click, you click on it just to take a look at what it looks like. Um, I just made this checklist quickly to see, well, what should students be able to do at uh, Div 2 level? So what I did was I went to the competency competency progressions on the New Learn Alberta site and looked at the uh, collaboration communication pieces, both from division one and division two. Uh, there, I made a similar one for division one based on their competencies and I just added to it to create the second one. So it might be something that uh, you may want to do at the start of the year, even to see where kids are with their discussion uh, abilities and skills and see where they rate themselves and keep on working at it. And every once in a while, I'll give them feedback to see where they can improve on their discussion skills. Because at the end of the day, discussion is one of those really powerful ways that students uh, demonstrate what they know and understand. And a discussion done right can really um, um, show us as educators where the students are at and what they know and, and maybe misperceptions that they have as well. And there might be, oh yeah, and the concept level is there at the basic level as well. Um, um, you'll, what you'll notice, it, and I'm calling these concepts um, that are important, they're not really visible in, in the cost line, but they're, they do show up in the word impact. We talk about negative impact and impact shows up once, and I think loosely before grade four, I think it's a grade two. But when you, if you were to search the grade four curriculum, you'll see impact show comes up quite a bit. Uh, it it's, shows up quite a bit in grade four, a lot in grade five and grade six as well. So to differentiate between what cause and effect is and impact or the relationship between those, um, there's an interesting little activity that you can use at the bottom there. Um, I don't think it's hyperlinked. Oh, uh, okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you mind if I go to the relationship one then? Because uh, it's because uh, it's concept attainment activity, and concept attainment activities have a certain process to them. If you're not familiar with them, I'll just give you a quick run through. And maybe the relationship is one a good one to do as well, because at the end of the day, cause and effect is a relationship um, idea. So if students know what a relationship is and how they can demonstrate or show relationships between ideas, then it's easy to flow into the cause and effect and impact because they kind of, this one kind of flows into the next one. So it's it's all right that they're doing this one instead. At the front of the uh, these activities, I always have a, a brief uh, description of what are the steps into planning a concept attainment lesson. We're not going to go through that um, but I will show you how one works if you're not familiar with it. And if you are familiar with it, have fun with it. So with a concept attainment uh, activity, what you do is you provide students with examples of the idea or the concept you have in mind and non-examples. So at the right, I have two pictures and together they represent an idea. I've got lightning and I got fire. On the right-hand side, I got lightning and a person walking. And that's not an example of what I have in mind. And we probably, if you're gonna use this one to establish or to build or introduce the idea of relationship, 
Um, a good idea might be to have these pictures printed because the more they can see them together, the stronger they can see a similarity between the yeses. So that's the focus is on what do all the yeses have in common. In this particular case, we got a plant and a watering can um, and a balloon and a watering can. Plant and a watering can has that idea that I'm thinking of. I'm going to the next one as well. I'm going kind of fast with these. We've got a clown and a person smiling. And then in the no, we've got a clown and a <laughs> rather unmodern piece of technology. Um, but if we if you were to imagine the other three pictures you saw together with the fire and the lightning uh, and the um, the plant on the watering can, the clown and the smile, you may start becoming, you know, hypothesize and come to the conclusion that a relationship is uh, is is evident there, that one thing makes the other thing happen. There's a connection between those two things we could talk about. And we could talk about what the relationships is between the slides we just saw. For example, a relationship between a clown and a smile is that a clown causes smiles. Or the relationship between a watering can and the plant is that we use water or watering cans to water the plants to keep it alive. The other ones where they may have, they don't have an obvious relationship. There might be something there, but it's not an obvious connection. And we're looking for the obvious connections here in this particular case. And then the rest of this um, concept attainment activity just has students explore relationships, seeing relationships, saying why they think this is an example of relationships and creating their own relationships. The next slide is just another example of that. Um, in this particular case, I, I want to stop on this slide a little bit because what I'm having students do with this now is to take the, uh, the ideas and to, to verbalize or write down and make that line and make that connection, say, what does that line mean? So we know that we have a lot of relationships with nature. If you look closely, we've got two people planting a plant there, planting a tree, some tree planters. So what's the relationship between humans and nature in this picture? Is it humans help nature or humans hurt nature? And clearly it's help nature in this particular picture. So we could draw the line between the two and put the word help. Same with the next picture. What, what do we see in the next picture? Here we would see people obviously hurting nature. And again, we would say that that's, uh, we can identify that with a line, that there's a relationship. We also put some describing words about what that relationship is. And you can see what I'm doing here is building that whole thing of making concept maps. Just concept maps are really powerful ways for students to demonstrate what they know uh, and understand. If they don't know what human is or nature is, they're not going to they're not going to be able to make that relationship connection. Uh, so when it comes to um, uh, other concepts, when we take a look in a bit later here, they can make those connections. Then we, we, we know they probably have a good understanding of both uh, both concepts in this particular case. We have two here. Uh, so one more slide to look at. And then you then you start giving more independence and have students come up with their own relationships that they may see and then practicing looking for relationships. Uh, and that's what the concept attainment does really provide examples, non-examples. You come to a consensus about what that, all the yes examples are, give it a definition, and then look for other examples, create other examples, and so on. So students become a bit familiar with it. So it's not just a matter of memorizing what a relationship is, but it's a matter of experiencing it, seeing examples, and seeing non-examples. And so the impact, cause and effect, on goes through with kind of a similar approach. Exactly. And uh, again, one of the skills in the far right-hand corner with this cusp is representation. And representation is one of those things that can be used in a lot of ways. Uh, representation is uh, those multiple ways to represent ideas. And it's simply showing something in a way to help communicate or understand something better. So a concept map that we were building in that last activity um, is, a, is, a, is a representation. As is mind map, if you look at those, a skit, drama, poem, all those kinds of things can demonstrate what we understand through a different uh, form, really. And infographic is one of those, and, and Chris has some other more information, I think, on the infographic that's going to help us to get you a better understanding of that particular representation. And if the students have never done an infographic, that's a great assessment tool for you as well as a teacher, because this gives me an opportunity to model and, and represent for you what I understand to be true. 
Uh, and so an infographic is just kind of like little mini sections. They have to be quite concise about what it is they're going to demonstrate. So you might say, you know, you're going to ask them to demonstrate what they think is the most efficient waste management procedure. And, and how would they show that to anybody who's in the hallway and in the school? If they posted it, would they be able to read it and understand it? Um, so the idea is not to write pages of information. The idea is to be succinct and to use uh, graphics and, and or, you know, images that are going to help enhance what it is that you're trying to teach. So I've just given an example here um, and just a suggestion, create an infographic that you could teach students in your school um, how best to look after the school environment. Maybe they pick one particular kind of recycling. Maybe they pick one of the other strategies. Maybe one of they do, we wanna point out how we are damaging and how this is, we need to be aware of this. So we need to improve on that. If you Google infographics, uh, because it's quite um, quite much, like it's, it's really something that's out there a lot in education right now. Um, and a lot of schools are using that as an assessment tool uh, for students. They give them the whole period of that's their test is to model a particular answer to a question that's given to them. Um, you could do the same thing here. And so you could, there's lots of free templates. You don't have to purchase anything. You've got lots available to you. And I, I will throw one into the folder for you as well. So you'll have that. All right, let's move to deep. Um, quite often to get kids to connect ideas, there's, and remember the deep is really put those concepts together and start building those relationships. So when you look at the understanding statement, that's your, uh, in this cusp line, that's what it is. It's a connection between those key concepts that we're taking. But some of the smaller concepts even are, are important to, to talk about either. For example, we know kids will have a good idea of production and waste if they can demonstrate what, what a relationship is between it or how is consumption and waste connected um, or how can reduce consumption because reduction in consumption and production was one of those ideas. How can, how, how do those lead to reduced waste? And, and so they start building those connections and saying, well, reduced consumption can reduce waste in this way and, and give some life or some good examples. Then we know that they've got a deep understanding of those connections. Um, Chris, I think there's, I forget what's on the next slide. We can go ahead to that one though. Oh, again, as I mentioned, uh, concept map is a is a useful way of, for kids to not only to try to develop their understandings, but to show their understanding or to test their understanding. Uh, what I've done here, and I have a typo in there. I apologize with reusing. Um, I'll fix that up. Um, these are a lot of the concepts that were in the concept map that I showed you earlier. But giving students a, a lot of these, and a lot of them are on the similar level, such as um, composting, uh, reducing, and um, repurposing and so on, they would all go into the same concept of, um, of uh, waste management methods and so on, but have them put these together and see what kind of connections they make. We did that one um, concept attainment activity where they're starting to put those things together. I wouldn't just jump from that one single line thing to a big one like this, but with more practice and giving, maybe just taking a chunk of these and, and separate them out, uh, having kids put those together uh, in some meaningful way, and then in telling you what that means is a really good way for them to show their understanding or work with that understanding you're trying to establish in that cusp line. Um, spectrum stores are often good. So if, you know, when we're, you, you could do this as a before and after, uh, you, you re, uh, investigate these with those activities that Chris showed at the, uh, in the, in the surface level, but have them put them on a spectrum. What's the most impactful when it comes to negative environment impact and what's the least impactful, uh, in terms of negativity on the environment, um, and hear their discussions, hear what they're saying and have them maybe keep that. And then, uh, after maybe as a deep activity, have them come back to it and say, does it, does uh, after what you've learned, does it match now and why? Why did you change it? What's different about it? So again, at the deep level, you're having them look at their understandings and, and testing them and realign them uh, to fit what they know and understand um, as they gain more information. Chris? Um, so that's uh, working with the, at, the, at the surface level and the deep level with um, um, uh, the first cusp line. The second cusp line is is really a very factually based one. Um, and uh, the, when you take a look at um, 
the understanding is very similar to the to the first cusp in terms of disposing in terms of waste with dangerous materials so some of those same conversations will come into the picture and of course when we're talking about responsible use we have to really focus on the hazards and and the hazard symbols with them so this is very much a more of a fact-based kind of a, a cusp line so we're going to walk you through some things that you can do to um, move through the surface level with this cusp and, and really, it is just a fact piece we need to start with. If children have never really looked at products before to see what kind of labeling is on there and to understand what that means, I've got to teach you that first. There's not much point in me wanting to have that conversation about how I'm going to be responsible about disposing this if I don't even know that it's a hazardous kind of material that I need to handle differently than I would just a water bottle. So they need to have that understanding, and that's why it's really at the surface level. So first of all, what are hazardous materials? Not every child is even aware or even would know how to articulate that. They definitely know that there are some things that they wouldn't drink out of a bottle for sure. And they know that they've been told that. And, and but, but what kinds of substances do I need to pay more attention to? Um, you know, why am I concerned about gasoline spilling on the ground? Like obviously it's very flammable, but I need to know that kind of stuff. That, that's important. So this video here is what are hazardous materials. So good starting point if you really are needing just foundational understanding. And then what happens in your household with, um, oh, there's the, some reason that one didn't come up. I'll fix that before we, we uh, put it out. What, what happens to the waste products in your household? Like what do you do with them? And, and where do they go? If you sort them, what if you don't sort them? And what if they go to the landfill? And what's the effect of some of those things that you just threw in the garbage? along with all the other garbage, um, what does it do to our areas where we have the landfill? So just good conversation again to follow up on, oh, yeah, that's not working for some reason. So we'll figure that one out. Household hazard waste is, is this is an, a really good video and gives them, again, just look around your kitchen, look around your house, look around what you see every day, but now turn it over and see what kind of a labeling it has on the back. And in order for me to read that labeling, I'm going to have to understand kind of what they stand for. So there are WMIS, our symbols that we have, depending on what kind of courses students are exposed to. Sometimes as early as grade four, five, and six, they're in CTR courses where they have the opportunity to learn about safety. And one of them is about WMIS symbols and, and how you treat things. And so again, so, uh, lab safety. This video here is all written, all right? It's cartoons, you don't have any sound to it. So you could have the kids who's a good reader, some kids alternate with that and just read it. But what they do is they unpack the symbols through the character of the two uh, children that are in the, in the video. And then this is a summative page of our common symbols that we use. They would see them in school. Once they get into higher grades and science, they're exposed to this more often because they're asked to interpret certain um, substances. Um, but I also put an enlargement in your folder that you can just run off for the students if you would prefer. Uh, just a little bit on, on some assessment and how um, um, transfer works together with this. Um, before I do, you know, I'm just, as you're going through there, I just imagine that at already a lot of you have a lot of your disposal, a lot of activities that can fit into that surface deep um, components as well. I just wanted to add, I think Chris, like the whole thing of um, waste management and there's lots of videos out there in case studies as well, produced by the Edmonton um, Waste Management Center. Uh, for example, how they're making um, useful gases out of the waste and so on. So uh, certainly Google those and certainly don't hesitate to use some of the um, activities or, or some of the case studies that you've already been using uh, with waste management in your current science course. Nonetheless, uh, when it comes to assessment there, um, if we're thinking about the whole transfer piece, that's really what we're trying to do with assessment is that's a really good place to lead the assessment because transfer is simply, um, providing students with a novel context um, in which they apply their understanding and take a look at that uh, what they know in a new context. So we're looking at waste and waste to waste management. Maybe it's going out to a park and say, how can we manage the waste in this part of this park? Or as Chris mentioned, activities in the school. So just transferring their understandings to a new context. 
throughout the unit, as you know, the formative assessment still works uh, with all the activities we give our students when when we're when they're working together. We do our observations and have conversations with them and examine their products to give us that formative sense of where they are and what their standing is. And just a reminder too that every time we use one of those verbs in there, what we're really asking them to do is to demonstrate their knowledge with their understanding. So you could take a look at the skills and procedures statements and probably replace it with some other verbs to also create an assessment piece when you're doing that. It, it doesn't have to be compare and contrast. It could be, but it could be um, another verb as well, such as um, uh, does, it could be discuss, it could be represent, it could be uh, a variety of those verbs. So don't hesitate to go there as well, it's just to provide students with a lot of different opportunities for them to show what they know and understand. Um, and too. Yep. That, oh, nope, that's right. They're just playing on what Ted just said, this is just an opportunity for them to see it in whatever light they can explain, express it to you. Any one of these could also be done with the infographic. Any one of these could be a a demonstration uh, procedure it could be where they actually create a slide deck to teach other people, right? It's whatever the students can model that learning that they've done using our terminology, really, that's really what we want here too, is we really wanna hear that scientific vocabulary used in an appropriate fashion. And so these are just some ideas that they could go into and, and demonstrate their learning. And I, as you already know, giving children choice so that they have a say in, in the, the sort of the direction they're going to go always gives you better buy-in than if you just say, here's the one and only way that we're going to do this. Um, there's not a whole lot of leeway for you to have choice. So again, most of these will get to any one of the transfer level conversations that we want. It's just a matter of deciding what you're wanting to, to have a, as a focus or not. So just some ideas and suggestions. Ted, did you want to add anything on that? No, that's fine. That's good. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Okay, we've got some resources again that uh, just that you'll find helpful. We recycle is one. Um, I'm going to enlarge these for you so that you can see them. But this is a really good little book. It covers absolutely everything that we talk about in grade four. So that would be a nice classroom library book to have. Here is the recycling for the Max Axiom series. This is the, the one that, that I was referring to where they have the cartoon or the graphic, um, but it, they're excellent books and the kids do like reading them. They're right up to junior high, they like reading them just for the action that's in there. I put in here also saving water because that is one of the pieces that inadvertently comes into when we're talking about recycling and we're talking about clean environments. This is one that comes up again, and it comes up when they get into earth sciences again, too. We talk about it there, but it wouldn't be inappropriate for a child to say, I'm going to talk about water. And I'm going to talk about the different ways that water is cleaned and how we manage our water and, and how do we make sure that we have enough drinking water and all those types of things. So it, again, it might be one of those things that a student is interested in. Another really good series or book, it's just one book, is this Human Footprint from National Geographic. I actually got this at Scholastic, I believe, um, but I did give you the ISBN number and the, the uh, author is down in the front here, but it has really got an excellent amount of information, just really covers sort of the kinds of things that a student would walk around even in the mall and see and make them start thinking about, wow, look at that, you know, that could be done differently. So that would be one of the challenges that we would ask them to do at some place here is that one of your outcomes was design a personal strategy or a personal plan that they're going to be part of improving the environment. Maybe they do that as a school initiative, right? What can we as a school do? How can we implement best practices if we don't already have best practices? How efficient are us? You know, some schools are recycle schools, but what happens to all your recycle stuff? Where does it go? And who's getting it? And what are they doing with it? That's covered in a number of videos that I provided with you. Why should I recycle? That's a great story to read for the students as well. Like, why do I even care? And now the question is, and you'll see that if you do some Googling, a lot of the questions come, should we even bother recycling anymore? If the countries who were gonna take our recycling aren't gonna take it anymore and we're keeping it all, then do we really care that it's been separated out or not? And the answer is if we do, of course, but. But that's, that is a question people are saying. Why are we spending any money on recycling if we've got no place to put it? So there's a debatable kind of question that kids could launch into. 
Um, these come from the grade three as well, but I think they would be rather relevant, especially if you're needing a little bit of background knowledge. So again, there's some properties of matter in here with a, a slide deck that you can download. And same thing here, there's properties of materials. So if I needed to go back and do a little bit of work there, especially if I'm going to talk about what breaks down, what doesn't break down under certain circumstances, then I might want to spend a little bit of time having a look at those as well. And then some of the books that I've shown you here, just to show you where they come from, who the publishers are, et cetera. Oh, I should go back this one here. Um, some of the little books that I showed you today, uh, like solid, liquid, what is it? They also come from the um, Pearson Publishing Spark Library. And those are available for teachers to access right now. There is a subscription for the Spark Library. However, they will offer any teacher um, a 30-day trial. So if you wanted to go in and just read the books, because you can read the whole book, you can see everything. Um, you might want to go through and decide maybe if there's you've got some money in the school and you wanted to buy a couple of books to the library or whatever. This will give you a little bit of a heads up. Um, in addition to the ones that Nicole Lamoureux and I are going to be going through when we just read some of the um, extra books that we've been able to secure just to see if any of those are a good match for you as well. Okay, and computing science, we have another teammate on our team as well for science, and that's Ange Deering. She is an IT um, teacher, and what she does really in Wetaskiwin Regional, she goes around to the classrooms and helps teachers take computing science and integrate it within their courses that they teach and specific to what they're teaching, not just in general, here's a bunch of theory about computing science. So what Ange will be doing and, and uh, we'll be posting her work over the weekend, um, she will give you sort of a 10, 12 minute video that says, how do I, as a grade four teacher, given that I'm teaching what I am in matter, how do I infuse computing science? What does that look like in grade four matter? What would I do? What was some sample activities? They're very um, well received and she'll send select the slide deck and give that to you as well. So if you wanted to go back and, and have a look at any of the other pieces. Do you wanna talk about scientific methods, Ted? Nope. I've been, I've been new. There we go. Uh, sure. As uh, Chris mentioned, uh, Nicole Lamaru working with her. She's also doing scientific methods and uh, um, creating videos that help explain what scientific methods is, is at each grade, uh, including grade four. And I believe, again, some videos on how to perhaps integrate it into the current um, or the different organizing ideas. Now, is, it would be important. There's a there's a grade two video and it would be important to watch that one because uh, in grade two, the, um, the the process, as I referred to the skills and procedures, procedure of scientific investigation is only broken out in the grade two scientific methods curriculum. So there it outlines the steps of, you know, um, asking a question, making a prediction, gathering the information and so on. That's where you'll find it in her video. Uh, it's available on the ARPD site. We'll, uh, we'll break that out. When it comes to grade four scientific methods, what you'll be looking at is a focus on the data part. Once you've collected the data, what, what is valid data, what is reliable data and so on, and how do you use that data to make a conclusion? So anytime you do an investigation in grade four, you're still following those grade two steps. But when it comes to scientific methods, you're focusing a little bit more on data and making sure it's sound, reliable, valid data. And um, I think that brings us to a close. Yeah. Now, before I stop the recording, just so that people who are watching this later um, in the chat box, I have just put the link for the ARPDC site. Um, and this is where we're going to be posting all of our resources. So if you're looking for the recording of this video, if you're looking for the slide deck and any resources we post, you go to that website and go into the new curriculum site. And if you just put in science into the search box and your grade, then this will come up. Now, it won't be posted tonight. It'll probably be posted sometime tomorrow. Uh, and then the work that was being done over uh, the weekend for the computing science will show up in there next week as well. So just keep checking back. There's no limit as to how many times you can go in and out and watch these videos or you also have access to any other grade as well. You're not limited to just grade four. 
You can go and look at any video, as Ted said, watching the, the grade two one would be a really good thing to do. So let me just stop our, our recording here first. And then if anybody has any questions and you won't be recorded, so not so self-conscious on it.